Hey, Happy Friday. This week we learned a lot about the business of Samsung making a smartphone, the VR race started to heat up in earnest, and ARM also announced their next generation processors. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, this week we start the brief with a Motorola who launched two incredibly good looking new foldables. The Razer 40 Ultra, which is called the Razer Plus in some market, has a super impressive new outer screen combined with flagship like specs for about a thousand bucks, while the Razer 40 Non Plus is arguably the world's first kind of mid range foldable with a Snapdragon 7 Gen 1 that should cost significantly less than a thousand bucks. I've tried the Ultra briefly and it's really, really cool. Motorola also this week launched the much less impressive Moto G Stylus 5G 2023 edition for $400, which while it does have a stylus on a budget, I guess, actually only offers an incredibly weak one year of guaranteed updates, which really feels like it just somehow be illegal. Next, Garmin announced two new hardcore watches for the active people among us called the Phoenix 7 Pro and the Apex Pro, which feature things like built-in flashlights, solar charging, better multi-band GPS and up to 37 days of battery life. That is like 36 days more than a Pixel watch. Kind of crazy. <laughs> Next, Google just killed the decade-old original Chromecast, ending support for the Gen 1 stick that they first sold in 2013. And Google also lost a patent lawsuit to Sonos this week over its smart speaker tech. Google has to pay $32.5 million for its infringements, or $2.3 for each of the more than 14 million speakers that the company sold. Only one of six patents that Sonos argued for ended up holding up, and the judge said that the whole thing was, quote, emblematic of the worst of patent litigation where they actually had to check whether the jury was actually awake during the trial. I mean, listening to someone else's patent litigation for a long period of time sounds hella boring, so I guess I can't blame them. <laughs> And the legal troubles continued this week with Amazon, who was fined $25 million by the US FTC over Alexa hoarding kids' data and not deleting it properly, despite warnings and nudges going back as far as 2018. A classic move for any aspiring tech giant. Just illegally hoard some data. Then Computex also just happened this week in Taiwan, and we've seen an incredible assortment of SSDs that need giant coolers or seats with RGB fans built in, and even Nvidia's new AI chips. And we talk about those and our favorite picks in general on the Friday Chill Out podcast. The episode is available to Nebula subscribers right now, so check it out at the link in the description. Okay, so for my first story of the week, we've gotten a ton of really interesting new data about the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. So the Ultra was apparently the fifth most most popular premium smartphone of the first quarter of this year, by a pretty wide margin, mind you. But most interestingly, counterpoint data shows that it actually cost Samsung $469 to make. This is kind of surprisingly $5 more than the iPhone 14 Pro Max, but surprisingly, it is way less than the Galaxy Note 20 at $549 from three years ago. Prices usually go up over time, obviously, so Samsung has been optimizing pretty heavily lately, it seems. Of course, keep in mind that these are only the so-called BOM costs or bill of material costs, which is the direct cost of making an actual phone, and there's plenty of other costs that a company has during its life cycle. But we also got a really interesting breakdown of the palm costs for the S23 Ultra. So the SoC, the display, the cameras, the memory, and the casting are the most expensive parts of the phone, with the SoC alone probably costing around an eye-watering $150 to $160. Interestingly, from a previous counterpoint breakdown, we can see that the wireless parts of a Qualcomm SoC, like their modems and the various licenses, they actually make up something like 60% of the cost of the SoC, while the CPU and the GPU and all the other things are actually the smaller part of the pie. So it's no wonder that the company is called Qualcomm rather than Qual GPU, I guess. <laughs> Also, as a fun fact, I just came back from London, where I talked with the company Nothing about things like bomb costs as well, and they told me that yes, the 8th Gen 2 costs something like $160 as well for them, but apparently the 8 Plus Gen 1 can be had for like half of that. So apparently Qualcomm is charging a very, very heavy premium for companies that want the best of the best and the absolute latest flagship chip. 
Anyway, Qualcomm is officially the biggest beneficiary of the Ultra at 34% of the costs, which is probably why the Exynos team has not given up on gaining back their business yet. And after Qualcomm comes Samsung itself, as they still make the display and a few camera sensors and a few other components. Samsung is kicking absolutely everyone's butts on the high-end Android market, with six different devices of theirs in the top 15, while Xiaomi and Huawei only managed one each, and brands like Oppo and Google have none. The $500 plus segment has also continued to grow at 4.7% compared to a year ago, despite the whole rest of the market collapsing, and so now 31% of people are buying premium phones, which is pretty wild. Okay, and for my second story of the week, as Apple is expected to bring their VR headset to market at WWDC in just a few days, it seems like the whole VR market in general is heating up again. Meta has just announced the Quest 3, their successor to their most popular headset yet, and they said that it will cost $500, it will be 40% lighter and way thinner than the Quest 2 as well, it will have twice the graphics performance thanks to a new Snapdragon chip, and it will also have fancy full-color pass-through much like the Pro headset as well. Funnily enough, the headset will only go on sale on the 27th of September, so Meta clearly announced it way in advance because they wanted to get it out before Apple. Meta also announced a ton of new games coming to their platform, and phone maker Oppo just announced their VR headset as well, which brings a heart rate sensor and the company's signature VOOC fast charging to the VR market. Meanwhile, the Apple headset is now getting last-minute rumors, claiming that it will feature micro OLED displays that can reach 5,000 nits of peak brightness, they can provide 4K resolution per eye, and they can reach 4,000 PPI for a very high-end experience. Also, the information claims that the headset itself will only be slightly thicker than an iPhone, which sounds way thinner than even the newly announced Quest 3, although this will come with two major trade-offs. One, you'll need an external battery pack that is hooked up to your pants, and two, there will apparently not be enough space for glasses, so you'll need magnetically attaching prescription lenses. Both of those sound like pretty clunky experiences, at least on paper, but maybe the thinness will just make up for everything. Who knows? Oh, and there are also reports about a knurled knob, like an Apple Watch's digital crown, to help transition between virtual and mixed reality. Pastor was already really cool on the Meta headsets that I've tried, but if Apple has significantly better displays and significantly better cameras and like a convenient little knob that you can twist around, I think that could be an actually pretty cool selling point. I'm generally very excited to see what Apple is going to do here. Okay, and for my third story of the week, ARM announced their next generation CPU and GPU designs, which most of the upcoming flagship mobile chips will be based on, and apparently the focus this year is not on power and performance gains, but rather efficiency gains. On the CPU front, the high-end Cortex-X4 core will only increase performance by 15%, but will consume 40% less power than the X3 did, and meanwhile the lower-powered Cortex-A720 and A520 will become 20 and 22% more efficient respectively, with no details at all on performance improvements. These are all figures assuming that there is no change in the manufacturing process, so the actual chips that will come out should be even better than this, and another change this year is that all the CPU cores are now going to be 64-bit only. Anyway, focusing mostly on efficiency rather than performance, at least for the CPU, seems like the right move at least to me. Over on the GPU front, we will get 15% performance per watt gains over the previous generation, 40% less memory bandwidth usage to save on power consumption across the system, and twice the HDR rendering capabilities. That said, of course, Qualcomm is using their own GPU tech called Adreno in their GPUs, Samsung is supposedly using AMD tech in theirs, and we've just reported on MediaTek partnering up with NVIDIA for their GPU tech, so I'm unsure about who will even use these new ARM GPU cores at all. But anyway, TSMC is apparently already optimizing its 3 nanometer process for these new cores, and Intel has also hinted at its 18A technology being optimized for it too, so that could create some interesting competition in the manufacturing front. Now, talking of manufacturing, you know how countries like the US are attempting to lure chip giants with huge subsidies like the CHIPS Act over? Well, it turns out that there are less than 100,000 graduate students enrolled in electrical engineering and computer science across the whole United States, meaning that a shortage of about 70 to 90,000 workers is expected in the chip industry alone, posing a major threat to the success of these political ambitions. STEM skills are incredibly valuable both in the US and outside, and there's no better place to 
get started with them than over at Brilliant. Brilliant is the best place online to learn math, science, computer science, and more. And what makes them so special is that they have these incredibly intricate interactive classes for just about every little thing that you will learn on the platform. You can pick an area that interests you, like maybe computer science or quantum computing, and you get a learning path to follow from beginner to advanced levels, with each topic being broken down into small, digestible chunks full of exercises that make you really understand the fundamental learnings right away. Whether you're aiming to find a new job or you just want to get smarter, Brilliant has the right solution for either. You can get a 30-day free trial at brilliant.org slash tfc, and the first 200 people who sign up using that link will also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So check them out, happy learning, and I'll see you next Friday.